Well, good evening, everyone. Evening. Uh, I want to welcome you to Salem United Methodist Church. My name is Matt. Uh, I know all of you in the room. Uh, I'm the pastor here at the church. And for those of you who are joining us online tonight, you are hopping in on a family meeting here at Salem United Methodist Church. And essentially, we're going to be talking a little bit about the future of the United Methodist Church and the future of Salem United Methodist Church, as the UMC has come to a bit of a crossroads on matters of human sexuality. So we're going to be speaking a little bit about that uh, tonight. So um, I'm going to be giving a lot of information, and um, towards the end of this presentation tonight, there's going to be an opportunity for, for Q&A. And uh, so those of you here in person, you can feel free to ask those questions here uh, in a little bit. Um, and those of you online, if you want to type those questions into the chat, that would be wonderful because I will be monitoring that from uh, my phone tonight. So I will take your questions live as they come in towards the end of the evening uh, as well. This will be about an hour long presentation and um, an experience together. So um, that's what you're here for. If you came tonight to uh, expecting to vote on something, I'm full of disappointments. That's, that's not what we're doing tonight. If you came to uh, pitch your shtick or uh, debate human sexuality, uh, again, probably disappointing for you. That's not what we're doing tonight. Uh, this is an informational meeting and a chance for you to ask your questions just about uh, the church and um, the future direction uh, where we presently find ourselves. So with that, uh, I want to invite us to a word of prayer, and we will begin. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, you are good, and you are faithful, and you have been moving and shaking the church for generations, for 2,000 years since Jesus walked the earth. Those who have, in, who have called you Lord have faithfully read the scriptures and have discerned your direction and your will for their lives. And we seek nothing less than that tonight, O oh God. And we ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon those who are gathered here and those who are joining us online as we discuss uh, the future of the United Methodist Church and Salem United Methodist Church. Lord, like a shepherd, we ask that you would lead us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So just to uh, a brief recap, because I see that some people are jumping in on, online on the internet. If you're just joining us, you're here for a family meeting, a town hall uh, for Salem United Methodist Church. My name is Matt. I'm the pastor here at the church, and we're just going to be talking a little bit about the future of the United Methodist Church as well as Salem United Methodist Church um, as we discuss matters of, of human sexuality. So with that said, uh, I want to open tonight by sharing a little bit about myself, why I am a United United Methodist and why I intend to be uh, United Methodist. Uh, I will share with you um, Bishop Tremble, who was the bishop that ordained me in 2015, once said that I am unashamedly Christian and I'm unapologetically United Methodist, and that's the hill I die on uh, tonight. Thank you. I'm also doing dad duty tonight, and my six-year-old is in the front row, so occasionally I may pay attention uh, to the front row here a little bit. Uh, I'm unashamedly Christian. I'm unapologetically uh, United Methodist, and the reason for that is, is because I've been surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses for 38 years as of uh, late last week. I just turned 38. Uh, of, of wonderful Christians that call themselves Methodists that have formed me, that have shaped me, that have called me into ministry. This church has confirmed that call and has sent and deployed me to various places all over uh, eastern Iowa uh, to serve Christ uh, in the church. Um, I was baptized as an infant at Asbury United Methodist Church in Bettendorf, Iowa. And uh, we, we, did the, we did the Sunday thing, we did the youth group thing, and my family had some interesting dynamics. Um, if you've met me, you know that I'm pretty ADD, and uh, it doesn't take a lot to get me distracted. And, <laughs> and I also have two siblings, my youngest brother um, and my oldest sister are both, uh, are both special needs. So if you were looking for a worshipful experience on Sunday morning, maybe, maybe not you'd aim for the same pew that the German family was sitting in. We usually sat in the back row, as most Methodists know, the Holy Spirit lives there, right? But uh, that's where we sat because we could be a distracting bunch and we thought maybe it would be a little less distracting back there. That was my parents' strategy. It never worked. My favorite game to play at church when I was about uh, Lemon's age was a game that I called pew surfing. 
and about halfway through the worship service, there would be this wonderful pastor-led prayer with musical underscore, just this Holy Spirit-filled moment, right? And every eye is closed and every head is bowed, and while no one is paying attention to me, uh, six-year-old Matt gets down on the floor, and I'd start weaving between legs and making my way up under the pews. And if I could get to the front row right here where Steve is sitting, there was a, lady, a dear saint of the church. Her name was Gertrude. And she sat in the front row every Sunday. If I could get up there, I'd snap her sock right before the pastor would say amen. And she'd let out one of those, wow! I mean, it was, again, Holy Spirit-filled moments with uh, Matt German. Uh, in church. But those were, I mean, I always found the church to be very welcoming and very accepting of me and, and my family uh, until I had an experience when I got to about confirmation age in the, in the eighth or ninth grade. And I was walking down the back hall of the church after a youth group meeting or a confirmation meeting one night, and the, the pastoral team was in the church walking down there, and they didn't realize that I was there, I don't believe. But I soon realized that they were talking about my family, uh, my, sister, my oldest sister in particular. And they said something to the equivalency that um, Bible studies and certain ministries of the church are really a wasted effort with her because she's retarded and she can't learn. And that's what I overheard this pastoral team say. And that crushed me. It absolutely crushed me. And, you know, when you're in eighth grade, you look at your pastor, it's like, that, that's the closest thing to God that you, that you know. And I was saying, if this is God's agency, if this is how God works, I don't, I don't want to be part of, I don't want to be part of the church. And, you know, I finished confirmation. I did the song and dance. But once I was confirmed and I was allowed to choose, I opted out, and I distanced myself from the church for, uh, for many, many years after that. Um, I got into my high school years of age, and um, I've shared with you before that, uh, that uh, algebra or math was going just fine until they put letters in it, and uh, I began to, I was always very, uh, very good in the classroom until I started studying uh, started studying algebra, and at that same moment, I also had um, a relationship with a girl that really just kind of fell apart. It ended in kind of a sad way, and I found myself um, in a state of, of depression, uh, and by the time my senior year rolled around, um, I had a, I had a 1.9 GPA, and I was skipping more school than I was attending, so much so that the principal had to call my parents into the administration office and say, look, Matt's skipped so much school this year, there's no way that we're going to let him graduate. And my dad kind of cut a deal with, uh, with the principal. He can be kind of a wordsmith. And uh, here was his pitch. Do you really want to do this again with him next year? <laughs> and the principal thought about that for roughly two seconds and said, okay, if he doesn't skip any more class, we'll go ahead and let him, let him walk and let him graduate. So my parents informed me of this, and they said, oh, here's a little, a little cherry on, on the Sunday for you. If, you. if you make it to graduation, uh, we'll send you out for a week to Orange County, California. You can spend a week with your uncle out there. And I was close with my uncle. I've always been close with my uncle. And at this point, I was hitting rock bottom. Uh, I was ditching more class than I was attending. Um, I had started experimenting in high school with, with drugs and alcohol and found myself in a, a state of dependency on several of those things and was just suffering from really severe depression. And before I got, I, I did make it. I, I graduated. That little ch uh, cherry on the Sunday was just a little bit of the inspiration that I needed. But before I got on that plane to head to California, I had penned a note to my parents why I was going to be taking my life when I got back from this trip. Uh, I was in a rock bottom place. I get off the plane in Irvine, California, and my uncle receives me, and I said, what are we doing tonight? And he's like, I, and I'm thinking babes and beaches, you know? I'd never been to the ocean. I'd never been to California, and I was like, this is going to be my last hoorah, my final ride before I cash in my chips and carry out my plans. And he says, well, we're going to church tonight. We're going, Randy, it's Thursday. He's like, yeah, I know, but our church has a, has a worship service on, on Thursday night. And here's what I knew, Steve, growing up, is that if I just 
behaved myself as a kid in church. I didn't have to spend the afternoon in my room, you know. Uh, so I'm thinking, all right, I'll, I'll do the dance. I'll go to church with Randy. I'm going to get on with my vacation, and I'm going to have my last hoorah. And Randy handed me a Bible on my way into the church that night. Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, California, back in July of 2004. And I still have this Bible in my office where he, before giving me this Bible, had written in some of his favorite Bible passages that still speak to me today. And I don't know what that pastor spoke about that night. I don't remember, remember the words, but um, I grew up in a very traditional church where it was an organ, and I walk in and there's guitars everywhere. Like, there's organ churches and then there's guitar churches, right? Here at Salem, we do both, which is kind of nice. But I didn't know you could have guitars in church. And I was like, wow, this sounds like stuff that, you know, I kind of listen to on the radio, except they're putting Jesus words to this. That's, that's interesting. And the pastor preached a message that night about how in Christ, your life can be made new, that you can have a do-over, that you can have a mulligan, that we serve a God of the first, second, third, and, and, and fourth chance. And the, the love of God in your life can set you free in this life and into the next. And in a, the desperate place that I was, uh, you know us Methodists, we're not really supposed to gamble. But you know what I did? I took a gamble that night. I took a gamble on God because I didn't really feel like I had another choice. And I went forward to that altar at, in Orange County, at, in Costa Mesa, California, that night, and I gave my life to Jesus. And when I got back from that trip, the day after I got back, my grandmother invited me to go to, to worship with her at Community of Joy United Methodist Church in Bettendorf. Now, I don't know how to tell Grandma no about anything. How do you tell your grandma no, much less going to worship with her? So I went with her, and I didn't know that she had spoken with the, the worship leader beforehand. This was a guitar church. I, I was fascinated with this. And the worship leader comes up to me after church and says, I hear that you play the guitar and you sing. I was like, yeah, I sing in the shower. Like, I've never done this in front of people before. And he's like, well, why don't you come to praise team practice next week? And I did, and that was my invitation into the life and community of the church for the first time in my adult life. And I began to love worship music. And I began to love the Bible. I began to love the, the, pastor's, the pastor's teaching. And three months after this, uh, our, our worship leader gets uh, an opportunity at, at another congregation. And when this is announced on that Sunday, my pastor invites me into his office after worship, and he slides a set of keys across the desk to me. He says, I want you to pray about being our next worship leader, and I want you to come in tomorrow and tell me yes. Pray quickly. I said, wow, um, I'm 19 years old. I don't know anything about faith. I don't know anything about the Bible, and you're asking me to lead people in worship. And lo and behold, the United Methodist Church took a gamble on me. And praise God that the UMC did that because I began to be discipled and I began to feel the call of ministry in my life that was cultivated in this little church in Bettendorf, Iowa, until about three years later, I get a call from the lead pastor of a United Methodist Church in Marion, Iowa. And he says, I want you to come and I want you to be our worship leader and youth pastor here. I've heard about the ministry that you guys are doing in Bettendorf and I really think you could make an impact here. And I'm 22 years old at the time. I'd never really been away from home. And I was informed that my living situation would be living in the basement of an elderly parishioner's home. And I lived in Lois McCormick's basement for three years as I served Marion Methodist for three years as their youth pastor and their worship leader. And I got the experience of, uh, of what a large, large church was like. And that, that was intimidating to me to walk into at first. And... In my time there, I've, I got many opportunities to preach with and do min hands-on ministry with, with youth and, and with elderly and everyone in between. And I was just sensing this call that I don't know what it is, but I feel like God wants to do something with me in this work in some way. And I was encouraged to go to seminary. So at that time, with a 1.9 GPA, the University of Dubuque took a gamble on me and admitted me 
and uh, I excelled at the University of Dubuque and loved my time there. Uh, completed an undergraduate degree in religious studies and then went on to study a Master's of Divinity degree there. In the course of that, I served St. Paul's United Methodist Church here in downtown Cedar Rapids for three years where we established a coffee house worship service in the basement of that church called Worship Cafe. And that thing within a year grew to exceed the capacity of that fellowship hall that we had to begin adding a, a second worship service. And I was like, oh my gosh, like God is, God is so good. And we're, we're winning new people uh, to Jesus, and the church is just packed every Sunday. This is just an amazing thing to participate in and be a part of. In the, th the final year, when you're in seminary, if you're uh, United Methodist intending to be clergy, uh, you're always waiting by your phone uh, the last semester of your senior year, waiting on a district superintendent to call you to tell you where your first assignment is going to be, where your first pastoral appointment will be. And uh, sure enough, Reverend Dave Crow calls me uh, in, uh, before anyone else got a call. I got a call um, with, in the first semester of my senior year. And he says, Matt, um, I have an opportunity for you. And when a district superintendent says that they have an opportunity for you, that means pack your bags. You're moving. Because Methodist clergy serve as itinerant pastors, and we serve year-to-year -year, uh, appointments uh, at the pleasure of the bishop and the district superintendents, right? So he gives me the profile of this church, and I head to, uh, I'm serving Marengo, which is about a two and a half hour commute one way from, from UD uh, my entire senior year, and we just had an amazing ministry there. And three years after that, uh, I get a call from Reverend Jackie Bradford, a district superintendent. She says, Matt, I have an opportunity for you. I was like, no. No opportunities. I, I have an opportunity here that I just love and that I'm, I'm just appreciating. And I've fallen in love with the people here. And I've baptized and confirmed their kids. I've buried their parents and their loved ones. And we've had all these celebratory moments and hard moments together. It's like, I, I love this church. Don't, don't take me away from here. And they said, the mission field needs you elsewhere right now, Matt. So I was informed I was going to be moving to Cedar Falls, uh, where I would become an associate pastor um, at a pretty large church up in, in that area where I had the privilege to, to learn and to serve under Reverend Steve Williams uh, for two years and then Reverend Scott Kilcober uh, for three years after that. We had a wonderful ministry there uh, for five years. And sure enough, three years ago, almost three years ago now, um, I get a call from Reverend Dr. Moody, Colorado. He says, Matt, are you in your office? I says, yes. He says, shut the door. I said, okay. And this is a district superintendent. And he says, Matt, I have an opportunity for you. And I said, okay, tell me what this is. He's like, the bishop wants to appoint you to Salem United Methodist Church in Cedar Rapids. And my first emotion was like, but we love it here in Cedar Falls. And the ministry is just so wonderful, and I love the people here. Like, every appointment I've ever received, I gotta tell you, my friends, is better than I ever deserved. It's better than I've ever deserved. And he told me about the profile of this congregation. I was like, wow, that sounds like it could be a really good fit. And I took a gamble with God again, and I said yes. And I will tell you that, that that is one of the best yeses I've ever given to the Lord or district superintendent because come this July, um, believe it or not, I'm going to be starting in year three of ministry with you all. And this denomination and this church is the one who baptized me, who called me, who formed me, who sent me, who ordained me. And I stopped in tonight to tell you that I'm unashamedly Christian. I love Jesus. When I talk about being saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm not just talking about something that happens in eternity. I'm talking about something that happens in the here and now, because you have to understand the church is what saved my life when I was 19 years old. And God is still saving me today and refining me more and more into God's likeness. Um, I was saved once, not all at once. I'm still a work in progress, just like all of you. Uh, but that work has been worked out through the ministries of the United Methodist Church. And I love this church. I don't know if I'd die for the United Methodist Church, but I'd definitely lay my life down for Jesus, as I vowed to in my ordination vows. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about who I am 
and why I, I love the United Methodist Church. And I love the structure of the church. I love its theology. Um, I love the polity of, of our church. Um, but we gather here tonight to talk a little bit about where the United Methodist Church finds itself presently on matters of human sexuality as far as the wider denomination and how do we understand Salem to fit in the midst of, uh, of all of that. But back in 1968, the United Methodist Church became a thang. That's when the UMC was formed. Uh, the Evangelical United Brethren Church uh, merged with the Methodist Episcopal Church. And my understanding is that Salem is actually a, f a former EUB church. And uh, at almost every one of these town halls, there's been a former EUB congregant. Yes? All right. Praise God. We we'll love it. We love it. Uh, so um, in 1968, we became, uh, we became a church. And ever since then, every four years, there's been a global gathering of United Methodists. And I say a global gathering because the United Methodist Church is a global moving enterprise for Jesus. We are on most of the continents of this world. We're on, in North America, we're in Africa, we're in Asia, and unofficially in South America as we have missionaries deployed uh, everywhere uh, in, that, in that region. So with that said, we're a global church, we're a connectional church. And with that also comes varying context throughout, uh, throughout the world. And every four years, there are delegates that meet to talk about our theology, to talk about our polity. In other words, how does the church function from a structural level, from, you know, denominationally to the local church structure? Um, and when those decisions are made, we find those decisions contained in our United Methodist Book of Discipline. And if you want to read a copy of that, like some light devotional reading tonight, um, stop in the library. You can grab a copy of that uh, if you want. Uh, but the, the Book of Discipline contains our theology. It contains our articles of religion. It contains our theological tasks. It talks about how we organize uh, our congregations um, and how we do things. Uh, some of that stuff is really boring, but all of it is really essential and really important um, for how we function and live together as United Methodists. So that said, every four years, there's a global gathering of delegates that are elected starting from the local church to the annual conference and then all the way to the global meeting at General Conference. In 1972, at the global gathering of United Methodists, which we refer to as the General Conference, there was some language that was inserted into the Book of Discipline that stated that homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Okay. Now we name that and say that, and that resonates differently with different people, depending on how you read and, and interpret the Bible, right? For some, that's, that's a warm blanket. For others, that, that doesn't feel so good, okay? And we acknowledge that and we name that tonight, right? Now, you think this conversation about human sexuality in the UMC is hot today. Let me t tell you a spoiler, it's been hot ever since 1972, every time we have a general conference, which typically happens every four years, this is a highly debated and contested uh, issue that we talk about uh, at general conference. So much so, it's been getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter until the present day. In 2016, we thought that we were gonna see some, something change in the Book of Discipline, because we have to understand that different parts of the world see this very differently. In the United States and in Europe, for example, um, we have a much more pluralistic society. Uh, Christendom, Christendom in and of itself is pretty much dead in the United States. Christianity is not the mainstream uh, stream of consciousness and thought uh, in the United States. And we have varying contexts, uh, even within the US, of how people feel about matters of human sexuality. We all know this to be true. But you go to places like the Philippines or like in Africa, these are much more theologically and politically conservative areas, so much so that homosexuality is illegal in some parts of the world. And not only is it illegal, but it's a capital offense. So some of this stuff is absolutely inconceivable in some other parts of the world. And keep in mind, we're a global church functioning with one book of discipline for all, right? So you can see how this can be quite, um, quite contested in different parts of the world. 
In 2016, we thought we were going to see something happen that would give some latitude uh, for contextuality across the world for this. That did not happen. In fact, in 2016 General Conference, we left that conference in, uh, in gridlock that has been, that we thought was actually going to split the United Methodist Church in 2016. And there was legislation passed on the floor of the General Conference in 2016 for the bishops to establish a commission on the way forward to lead us to a resolution so that we can move forward as a denomination and lead this contested place that we've been. There was a special called General Conference that met in 2019 strictly to talk about matters of human sexuality. And some of you remember, may remember that general conference. I want to explain briefly two plans that were proposed for the church on the floor of general conference 2019. One of them was called the One Church Plan. Okay, this is important, the One Church Plan. And essentially, uh, this is the plan that was endorsed by the Council of Bishops and also recommended to the General Conference uh, from the Commission on the Way Forward. And what the, general, the, the One Church Plan consisted of was this, that the prohibitive language in the Book of Discipline around LGBTQ individuals would be stricken, it would be removed. Now when I say prohibitive language, because I'm going to reference that term, I want to uh, qualify what I mean by that real, really quickly. Currently our Book of Discipline on matters of human sexuality states um, that uh, it still states that homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. It also states that self-avowed practicing homosexuals are not to be certified as candidates for the ministry in the United Methodist Church. It also clearly states that um, same gender weddings or unions are not to be held in United Methodist preaching houses. Okay, so all of that is found within the United Methodist Book of Discipline. So when I say the restrictive language, that is the language that I'm referencing, okay? So the One Church Plan addressed the restrictive language. It said, let's strike the restrictive language and let's rewrite it to say this. That first of all, um, LGBTQ individuals would not be prohibited from becoming clergy. That would be up to their annual conference's Board of Ordained Ministry. Now, the candidacy process to become an ordained pastor in the United Methodist Church is typically a seven, eight, nine year trajectory. It's a pretty rigorous uh, process. Um, and you have to be examined by the Board of Ordained Ministry. And if you're found to be fit and called through that process, then you are recommended for, uh, for ordination. So that would still happen, but that LGBTQ individuals would be able to go through that examination process, okay? Um, the second part of the One Church Plan stated that pastors would not be prohibited from doing same-sex unions, but they also wouldn't be forced to do same-sex unions. So essentially, that would be a matter of conscience for each individual pastor, whether they wanted to officiate those weddings or not. Is that making sense so far? The, the third part was that local churches would also determine their own building usage policies around weddings. So no local church would be forced to have a same-sex union in their church, but no church would be prohibited from doing that. The point of this was to allow contextuality for the global church to be able to have some latitude to move and function while remaining a connectional global church. The One Church Plan failed on the floor of General Conference in 2019 by fairly slim margins. And what passed was the traditional plan, is what it's referred to. And what the traditional plan do, does is retains the restrictive language in the Book of Discipline, but it also added something. And depending on how you perceive this, some would say it added accountability measures, some would say that the denomination doubled down and added teeth. And essentially what it added was that if a pastor officiated a same gender wedding and they were brought up on charges and found to have done this, that they would automatically be suspended for a year without pay. This is currently in our discipline. And if they did it again, that they would have their clergy credentials revoked and they would no longer be a minister in the United Methodist Church. Now, some people celebrated the passing of the traditional plan while others were deeply um, 
deeply lamenting this. What we left with in general conference was actually everyone was upset. Whether you're traditionalist or whether you're more progressive. And that's because if, um, for obvious reasons, if you're more progressive on this matter, uh, you would probably find the language in the Book of Discipline harmful. If you're more traditional, you're not very happy because in the passing of this plan, many centrist and progressive clergy said that um, we will do these weddings in response to this law, this church law that has been passed. And clergy charges and clergy trials are very expensive for the denomination to do. And the amount of clergy who came forward and said that they would do this out of protest, uh, it was literally impossible to enforce uh, the Book of Discipline on this because it would essentially bankrupt the, the, you know, the UMC. So what we happen is we have a bunch of traditional folks that are really upset about this. We have a bunch of progressive folks that are really upset about this, and now we have a book of discipline that's not functioning or serving our denomination well. And that's where we're at right now. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, so with that, in response to that, in January of 2022, our, our bishop, uh, our former bishop, Bishop Lori Haller, and the cabinet of the Iowa Annual Conference released a policy for the United Methodist Churches in Iowa. And essentially what it reflected was the one church plan. And what that means is that every pastor in the annual conference would be able to marry whom they choose according to their conscience, including same gender weddings if they choose to. No one would be forced to, no one would be prohibited from. It also stated that local churches would be able to be able to determine their building usage policies around same gender weddings, okay? Iowa, we have been operating that way for uh, about a year and a half now, okay? That's where we are, that's where we presently are. There was, however, um, so many, let's do this, many, many have come to think on matters of human sexuality, that this has been a progressive decision or a traditional decision. We have to go left, we have to go right, and depending on what the denomination does or how we feel, we may, may have to leave the United Methodist Church for matters of conscience sake, right? So we've, for a long time, thought that there were really two boxes people find themselves in. And because we love stupid categories here, right? Let's put progressives on the left, because it just, that's what we do. So if you're progressive on matters of human sexuality, and when I'm referencing human sexuality, I'm talking about uh, how we view our understanding of scripture and LGBTQ individuals, um, you would say that as you read and interpret and understand the Bible, that this is a matter of justice, that this is a matter of inclusion. Some would say that we celebrate an open table, but not, our all, not all are truly welcome to the full ministry of the church. And that seems unjust, right? So I will also say, well, let's put traditionalists on the right, because, you know, we love our categories. If you are more traditional in your view of human sexuality, you would say as you read, interpret, and apply the Bible that, um, that you would agree with the restrictive language in the, in the Book of Discipline, that you would see this as an issue of sin, that as you read and understand the Bible, you understand that God has said no to this, and that we don't want to bless that which God has said no to. Does that make sense? So that's how I'm just trying to qualify these two, uh, these, two, uh, these two boxes. Now, there are nuanced arguments about why this is a good idea. There are a lot of nuanced arguments about why this is a good idea. And what I will say is that um, very smart, critical thinking uh, scholarship has been um, out there for a long time to support this very smart, critical thinking scholarship for a long time, biblical scholarship has been out there a long time uh, to, support, to support this view. I am not saying I'm the smartest person in this room, 
okay? But I am saying that I'm willing to venture, um, I do know that there's another pastor in the room, but I would be willing to guess that myself or another individual in here has probably studied this issue more than anyone else in this room, just by the nature of what we do, right? Um, I understand why some people land in this box, and I have no judgments. Um, I understand why some people land in this box, and I have no judgments. I understand. Uh, but we've also thought for a long time that we're either this or we're either this. And depending on what the denomination does, um, maybe because of conscience sake, we would have to leave the United Methodist Church. What if I told you that actually that really doesn't describe the landscape of Iowa, it doesn't really describe the landscape of the United States and most of Europe for most United Methodists. There's actually subcategories within these two boxes. Now these categories, I will just lead with saying, are not meant to be affirming or demonstrative in any way. It's just the best language that we can apply just to conceptually consider this, right? Um, the outlying box would be referred to as a non-compatibilist. Non-compatibilist. And we find that same category on the progressive end of this. Non-compatibilist. And essentially what that means, if you're traditional, and you're, you hold a traditional view of marriage as you read, understand, and apply the Bible in your life. But you would also say, if the denomination gives sanction or allowance for other individuals to do this, I can't be part of the same church that would give allowance for this. Does that make sense? Hence the term non compatibilist and you would say, I would have to leave the United Methodist Church. Does that make sense? Same thing on the progressive end of this. You would say this is a matter of, um, of justice, and if not only should United Methodist churches be allowed to do these types of weddings, but furthermore, all of our pastors and all of our churches should be expected to host those types of weddings, because to not do that, if you land in this category, you would say that would sanction injustice by the church. And for a matter of conscience sake, I wouldn't be able to be a United Methodist if that wasn't the way the church works, so I would have to go. Does that make sense? That's why these categories are called non-compatibilists. It's not demeaning, it's not demonstrative in any way. Now, however, there are two more categories. That, that describe United Methodists in Iowa. And those are referred to as compatibilist categories. So you hold this same viewpoint. Um, you, if you have a progressive viewpoint or a traditional viewpoint, both of these individuals hold very uh, deep-seated um, beliefs around matters of human sexuality. But they also say, um, I can still stay in the same denomination if, this, if another church in my town that has a cross and flame on it uh, believes differently about this, if their pastor thinks something differently about this, or maybe they have a different building usage policy than we do. We can, we can still remain in the denomination together. We can play in the same sandbox, and furthermore, we can be in connectional ministry with one another where that makes sense, okay? It is estimated that 12 to 15 percent of the United Methodist congregations in Iowa will disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church because they find themselves in either this category or this category. And percentage-wise, most of them find themselves over here. Okay? That said, 85% of the annual conference finds themselves somewhere in this messy middle where they hold deeply convicted views about matters of human sexuality, but they say, I can still stay in the United Methodist Church so long as my church isn't forced to compromise my convictions. Does that make sense? 85%. Yes. 85% of United Methodists in Iowa find themselves in either this category or this category. Right? So, most United Methodists feel that they can remain United Methodist so long as their local church doesn't compromise their convictions. 
Does that make sense? In other words, we can remain in connection with other United Methodist churches that feel differently about that. So, the question becomes for us here at Salem, what box are we? Right? And that's a complicated question, because you know why? This church is very diverse. We have very traditional folk here. We also have very uh, progressive folk here. And most of the people in this church find themselves probably more in this category of you know, holding deep, deep convictions um, about this. Uh, some have asked, Matt, what's your prediction of what's going to happen? Well, um, here's, here's, my, here's what I want to happen. I want the church to make a decision, right? Um, Everyone has deeply held convictions about this, including your pastor. However, um, I made some promises at the last town hall meeting, if you don't recall. I said, first and foremost, um, I, will, I will tell you everything that I know that's going on within the, within the conference and within the denomination. There are no secrets. There are no advantages to that. I want everyone to know everything that's going on, right? And secondly, I said that I'm not, I will do nothing to hijack the church, uh, the church is going to make a determination upon which of these categories uh, they find themselves in. And um, so some people said, well, Matt, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm unashamedly Christian. <laughs> and I'm unapologetically United Methodist. And I intend to remain a United Methodist pastor. And my hoped for outcome, if anyone asks, is that we remain a United Methodist church and I get to remain United, your United Methodist pastor. Um, mm-hmm. So the question was, if you're a compatibilist, are you compromising something? Is that what I'm understanding? Well, I compromise to remain together, I guess. I just didn't know something that I something in return to stay together. I guess that's what I... Giving up or... So in, in this category, there's really not any winners or losers. Okay. Because you can, you can be deeply... Um, hold very deep-seated views from a progressive standpoint. You can also hold very deep-seated views as a traditionalist. But ultimately, what you would say is that I can remain a United Methodist so long as I'm not forced to compromise my convictions on this. Right? I'm going to come back to questions in a minute at the end. I want to finish a couple of things of explaining this, but I will, I will be taking questions here um, in just a few minutes. So, um, again... It's estimated that 15% of the congregations in Iowa would disaffiliate. 85% of the congregations in Iowa are projected to remain United Methodist, um, somewhere in this messy middle, right? So I just want you to know that. Um, now, some have asked me, Matt, what's your projection? What do you think is going to happen for, for Salem? And I say, well, first of all, the church is going to have to make that decision, not the pastor. But based upon my conversations about this with of several of you in this room and the wider constituency of our church, I would anticipate that Salem finds itself in this messy middle somewhere, right? Um, that said, um, I want to explain another part that was put into the traditional plan um, in 2019, which is referred to as paragraph 2553. And paragraph 2553 does a couple of things. It allows for gracious exits for churches that don't feel they can remain in the United Methodist Church anymore. But there's a couple of stipulations to paragraph 2553. First of all, the only reason you can disaffiliate under paragraph 2553 is on matters of human sexuality. You can't do it because, you know, you don't like the bishop or you don't, you know, all those sub subsidiary issues, um, your charge conference would never move forward. It has to be on matters of human, uh, human sexuality, okay? Um, there's also financial obligations that the church would have to fulfill if they wanted to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. Uh, that would include two years of apportionments. It would also include um, the unfunded pension liability. There have been clergy who have 
well, served our denomination faithfully for many years, and um, including churches that would disaffiliate. And we want to make sure that those clergy, uh, that their pensions and retirement benefits are fully funded, even if people leave the denomination. So that's part of the Book of Discipline. Um, for Salem, what does that mean in dollars and cents? We pay uh, $32,725 and change in apportionments every year. So two years would be $65,000 and change that we would have to pay to the annual conference if we chose to disaffiliate from the UMC. If you include the pension liability, the pension liability comes to about $74,000, okay? So total, that would be $139,000 uh, $139,409,000, uh, excuse me, let me make sure I say that correctly, $139,409. Did that make sense? Because the first two didn't. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. Um, here's the other part of this. Um, it would, a church would have to t call a charge conference or a church conference, which is a congregational vote of the membership of the church. And by discipline, it would have to pass by a supermajority, which means 67% to disaffiliate from the UMC, okay? Um, and here's the other thing. We would have to notify the district superintendent of our intent to disaffiliate by June 30th to be able to disaffiliate under paragraph 2553. The reason that many churches are disaffiliating under paragraph 2553 and the reason that that's intriguing to some of them is because of a matter called the trust clause, okay? Um, you may be surprised to know, though we have um, faithfully given uh, our tithes and offerings to build this wonderful facility uh, that we sit in right now, the building, the property, and the assets do not belong to Salem United Methodist Church. The building property and assets belong to the Iowa Annual Conference. And that's true for every United Methodist Church. The property and assets belong to the Annual Conference. Now you may be saying, well, how the heck does that work? Why don't we, why don't we own our own building? Well, this is actually where I believe John Wesley was very smart when the formation of the United Methodist Church happened. We hold these assets in trust and steward them on behalf of the denomination. And the reason we don't own our own building, because let's say Pastor Matt makes, wakes up tomorrow and says, I want to be Baptist, you know, and we're going to tr teach Baptist doctrines here uh, in our church. Well, the denomination is going to say, well, you guys can go be Baptist, that's fine, but you can't do it with a cross and flame on the building, uh, and you'll have to go find new space in which to do that because we're going to appoint a United Methodist pastor to uphold and preserve the doctrines of, of the church. That's why the trust clause exists. It's to preserve the doctrines of our church, right? Um, but this has been an, an issue for churches that have wanted to leave the denomination in the past because they can't leave with their building and they can't leave with their assets. Paragraph 2553 relaxes the trust clause until June 30th, where churches can do that if they choose to with their building, assets, and property. They also leave with any debts that they have as well. So like, for example, the mortgage on this building would also go with the congregation, um, would also go with that uh, as well. So where we're at in this process, uh, you may have received a letter, I hope you have, uh, from the church. Um, we've been communicating this since the first part of May, um, but there is a 67% threshold that would be required from a voting standpoint for us to disaffiliate from the, from the UMC. If you found yourself perhaps in one of these categories, these, this non-compatibilist category, whether you're a traditionalist or progressive and you're a member of the church and it would be your desire for Salem to disaffiliate, you would have to let us know that by May 30th, okay? And the vehicle of which to do that is you can send me an email, Matt German uh, at SalemChurchCR.com. You can also call the church office uh, and let that be known to Melinda. Uh, you cannot submit this anonymously. Uh, we do need to know who you are because it has to be a member of the church that expresses this, nor can you proxy vote for someone else. You know, you can't say me and my gackle of gals want to do this. Well, the rest of the gackle would have to communicate that, right? Um, but we set a very low threshold. If 20% if of our congregation uh, response that they want to move towards disaffiliation, then the, our next step would be to enact a straw poll, 
of the entire church. And if the straw poll numbers would suggest 67%, then at that point we would call a charge conference for a formal vote on disaffiliation. Now I will say, um, we've been announcing this since the first part of May. Um, no one has, in our church membership or constituency has expressed interest uh, specifically towards disaffiliation. Um, but we have till the 30th to cross that 20% threshold. So if that describes you, I would encourage you to contact me or someone on our leadership board and let us know of that desire because that will determine our next steps and how deep we go into exploring the disaffiliation process. Yeah, so the question was, for those of you online, the question was, if we don't cross that 20% threshold, would we remain a United Methodist Church? The answer is yes. If we don't hear from you, we assume you want to remain United Methodist. Um, if we don't cross a 20% threshold, we won't pursue any more steps in the disaffiliation process and we will remain a United Methodist congregation. Again, uh, we've set a deadline uh, for, May, uh, for May 30th to cross that 20% threshold just because we have to allow time to care um, for that June 30th date that is required by the Book of Discipline to give notice to the district superintendent. Okay, at this point, I have said quite a bit, and I want to, uh, I want to stop for a second and uh, formally open this up for questions and answers. If you are joining us online, you can feel free to submit uh, a question in the chat on Facebook. I am monitoring this, and I certainly will uh, respond to any of your questions. So... Do we have any outstanding questions about the disaffiliation process? Yes, please. Oh, okay. So, the, yeah, the question was, yeah, yeah. The question was that of this middle category of compatibilists, was there a statistic released of what percentage was more traditional, what percentage was more uh, progressive? No, that hasn't happened at this point, just because many churches are going through this process right now, and they haven't identified yet. So um, we don't know that for certain. What we do know is that we did do a, uh, uh, there was there was legislation that was put on the floor of our annual conference meeting in 2019 to kind of take the temperature of our annual conference um, based upon the delegates that were uh, sent to the Iowa meeting of United Methodists. And um, there was an overwhelmingly large percentage uh, majority vote of disapproval of the traditional plan. Um, and the reflection of our jurisdiction, which includes several of our surrounding annual conferences um, and the United States and Europe, is a desire to move forward with a one church plan type of model. That is the future of the United Methodist Church. Um, the question remains, can we all play in the same sandbox together, right? You do like sand, <laughs> yes, very good. Or for conscience sake, <laughs> You're so sweet. Uh, for conscience sake, um, because of convictions, um, would, you, would you feel that you need to be in a different denomination? Right? Yes, Steve. I understand today there was a uh, meeting of the annual conference mm -hmm. and a certain percentage of churches in the annual conference decided not to play in the sandbox. That's correct. Yeah, great question. Uh, for those of you online, the question was, uh, well, it was stated that um, there was a special called annual conference meeting last night for the Iowa annual conference, and that was to care for churches that identified that they wanted to disaffiliate uh, back in November. There were 83 churches that disaffiliated from the United Methodist Church from Iowa last night, which comprises about 10% of the Iowa annual conference. 
we are going to be, so the reason that we have this second opportunity for disaffiliation is because there will be another special called annual conference in November, which is why we have to give notice for this by June 30th, if the church should so desire to disaffiliate. So we will be caring for disaffiliations a second time in November as the Iowa Annual Conference. It's gonna be a much smaller number of those churches at that uh, meeting than uh, this first time around. Again, it's projected 12 to 15% of congregations in Iowa would disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. So of 83 churches, that was about 10% of the annual conference last night. That's a great question. Uh, there, once you disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church, you no longer call yourself United Methodist. That you can be certain of. However, um, there has been a, a denomination that has formed primarily for these individuals called the Global Methodist Church. Many individuals are finding home and sanctuary in the Global Methodist Church. There are some churches that are also um, go, choosing to be independent churches non-denominational churches. There's a handful of, well, not a handful. There's a, there's a number of those that are doing that as well. I'm sorry? Yeah, I'm not, I haven't really been talking about that one so much just because that only consists of about six or seven campuses. Um, but it, um, it, it could potentially blossom into something more, but the World Collegiate Church is another uh, Wesleyan expression that's uh, kind of arrived on the scene as well. Um, keep in mind, as United Methodists, uh, we have clear doctrines. We have clear polity, the way that we care for things and, and do things. If the church were to become independent or not affiliate with the denomination, now all of a sudden you have to create your own leadership structures. You have to create your own uh, theological credos for your church. Um, all those things that a denomination does, uh, you don't have those benefits of. Uh, for some, that's very appealing uh, and very, very freeing. Um, but Statistically speaking, most independent churches don't survive the tenure of their first pastor because you're also responsible for finding your own clergy and developing them, right? And what standards do you have for clergy? What educational requirements do you have uh, for clergy? What, um, how, how do you um, determine fitness for ministry and whether that pastor reflects the theological values of the congregation? That all becomes responsibility of typically a board of elders in an independent church. Now, that's appealing to some. That's obviously not appealing to others for, you know, matters of conscience sake as well. So let me again explain clearly what our process is to explore disaffiliation. There's three steps. The first step is 20% of the membership of this church. We have 277 souls that are members of this congregation. That equates to about 55 individuals. 55 individuals would have to express an interest in disaffiliation by May 30th. That takes us to the 20% threshold. If we were to surpass the 20% threshold, then we would enact a straw poll and essentially what the straw poll would do would be to see if we have numbers that would substantiate 67% in order to do the third step, which would be to ch call a church conference to have a formal vote on disaffiliation. Some may be asking, well, why are we going through all the steps? Why don't we just call, call a charge conference? Well, the problem with calling a charge conference, when you place a vote, there's winners and losers. There's winners and losers, and it's very divisive for congregations. Um, so our intent is we're not afraid of the process. We will do the process if the process is warranted, but we also don't want to take the church through what could be a very painful experience if it's really not reflected that that's necessary. That's why that 20% threshold exists, and then the straw poll, and then, and then the charge conference. So again, we will, we will execute the process if it if the process is warranted, and those will be the metrics by which we use to measure that. Yes.
Yeah, great question. Yeah, so currently our, our book of discipline has not changed since 2019. It still reflects the language of the traditional plan. Our Iowa bishop and our cabinet have said that the policy that they have released is in violation of church law. It is in violation of the book of discipline, right? Because the restrictive language exists in the book of discipline, but they have released a policy uh, for pastors to operate with more freedom than that. And they did that because of the contextual diversity of our state. Uh, and it was done to preserve the unity of the United Methodist Church in Iowa, right? So um, the traditional plan is what stands. Every jurisdiction within the United States at jurisdictional conference has reflected that they will move forward with a one church plan model. That is the future of the United Methodist Church. Now, the Global Gathering of Methodists, which is called General Conference, will be meeting again for General Conference in 2024. I can't tell you what's going to happen at the General Conference in 2024 because it hasn't met yet. But that is, that's the reality of our church law and the way that most of the United States is operating in response to that church law. Uh, could it be revised in 2024? It likely will. Uh, what many are predicting is that there's going to be some sort of, um, rather than having a book of discipline that exists for the entire denomination, that essentially the United Methodist Church is going to become more regionalized. We'll be connected in mission and many of those other things, but the book of discipline will have more variance in it for contextual, uh, for regions, uh, for contextuality. Um, now, if... Will the restrictive language be removed in the Book of Discipline in 2024? We don't know. We don't know until that, that gathering happens. But it is safe to assume uh, that the one church plan model is how we will continue to operate and what our Iowa bishop has said that she will be enacting moving forward um, so long as she is our bishop. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. Yes. That is correct. So thank you for that question. Um, the question was, what does this mean contextual? What's our contextual reality really at Salem right now and in, in the midst of all this, right? Um, our building usage policy has not changed at Salem. So what that means is that we do not currently host same gender weddings at our church. Um, now that can be, um, that can be explored for our congregation in the future. We had the option to change that. However, um, I want to be clear, absolutely clear. Everyone say clear. Very clear, right? Okay. Um, the conversation that we're having tonight is not about the building usage policy. The conversation that we're having tonight is about what is our relationship to the United Methodist Church? Do we intend to remain United Methodist? Because you can be a traditional United Methodist Church and still remain United Methodist. You can be a progressive United Methodist Church and be United Methodist. Or you could do that outside of the bounds of the United Methodist Church. So the conversation at this point for us is, are we choosing to be UMC or are we going to go be something else? And then at that point, we have the conversation about, you know, what is our building usage policy uh, after that in response to that. But our current reality is that we do not do same gender weddings at our church because our building usage policy has not changed. That can be reviewed at any time in the future. Yeah, so that's part of the policy that, um, the, that the bishop has enacted, um, that even if a building usage policy has not changed for a congregation, keep in mind, pastors can choose to officiate weddings of their choice. Congregations hold 
uh, the determination of the building usage policy. So should a pastor choose to officiate a same gender wedding and their building usage policy doesn't reflect that, they can officiate that wedding elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. So the the, the question was uh, the two town hall meetings uh, were they the same content presentation as this meeting? The answer is yes. Uh, all three of these meetings have been the same. It's just been multiple opportunities for people to to attend them. Okay. Any other questions tonight? All right. Well, I am going to be sticking around for a few minutes. Lemon seems to be doing pretty good tonight, so I'll be hanging for a few more minutes. Uh, if you want to talk to me, uh, feel free to. Uh, if, if you have an interest in disaffiliation, um, keep in mind uh, May 30th is the deadline to uh, contact myself, uh, send me an email, call the church office. Uh, all of that will be held in confidence. Uh, we're not publishing this information. So um, feel free to do that. Um, and also, if you have uh, questions or follow-up conversations that you want to have about about Salem or where your pastors at on some of these things, uh, I would welcome the opportunity to go get a cup of coffee or a beverage with, with any of you. So um, I'm happy to meet with you uh, individually uh, as well face to face if you would like to have further conversation. So that said, um, let's pray and uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and release you uh, nearly on time. Matt, my goodness, wow. All right, let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for the generosity of spirit uh, found in, in this room. We pray for discernment for each of us, not simply individually, but collectively as, as your church. Lord, I would pray that we would remember that we will never look into the eyes of someone that you do not wildly love, and that while we have diversity in convictions, may we have the same heart towards one another. Our right decision can be completely undermined by the way we get there. Help us to remember, O oh God, that you have instructed us through Jesus when he said, a new command I give you is to love one another. And they will not know that we are Christians by our correct doctrines or by our right allegiances or what brand hangs on our church buildings. But Jesus said that they will know that you are by my disciples by how you love one another. May we continue to have these conversations in grace and charity towards one another. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you all very much.